Yes, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 14th of January, 2015. And um, for several weeks now, we've been talking about Black Lives Matter. We've been talking about, um, and, and, most, and where, one of the places it's led us to, and here I'm going to make a connection, is to um, moving the race conversation forward. And you'll notice the word conversation there. Um, something that I've been really fascinated by for some time is uh, the work of um, ask, ask Big Questions, um, which we um, are blessed to have the director and founder of here, and he'll describe it more. Um, I just, I, and I, I'll say one more thing. Um, we, we also have Dan Dorenberg with us. When he saw you were coming on, he wanted to come on too. Um, and we've been messing around with Now Comment. Um, as a place for online conversation as well. So I think all of us, um, and Chris, Chris Sloan and I started, I've been saying it's 12 years old now, so um, <laughs> uh, Youth Voices for 12 years now. Um, and conversation is has always been the heart of what we try to do there. It's an um, online asynchronous conversation. So that's one of the big words here tonight. Um, but we want to learn from you, um, Josh. Um, Fagelson, and um, you'll explain what you're all about here a little bit. And then we do want to, we have been talking for some time about how to get kids connected more, looking at one text, maybe doing um, something like this, um, a hangout around a conversation. So that's our sort of practical aim here on mm -hmm. Teachers, Teaching Teachers tonight, too. So there's a lot to accomplish there. Um, but we want to start with you, Josh. Obviously. Great. <laughs> so Great. tell us a little bit about Ask Big Questions. Great. Um, well, yeah. thanks for having me, and I'm really I'm delighted delighted that we we made this happen and come together. And so, um, and and you know, for me, this is a bit of a homecoming because both my parents were were teachers or started out as teachers, and so uh, you know, that's always been and, and and I'm continuing that work in in one form or another. So I'm really I, I think you're happy absolutely that, an educator. <laughs> So I certainly call myself an educator, not a classroom teacher, but but definitely an educator. So I'm um, really glad to be here. Uh, so ask big questions. Um, we, I'll, I'll tell the you know one of the stories that we tell about how this all got started. Um, about ten years ago, uh, I had just finished rabbinic school. I came to uh, Northwestern uh, in Evanston, Illinois, to be the the rabbi there at the Hillel. And uh, like many rabbis in the summertime, I was thinking a lot about how are we going to get students um, and other people to know about the Jewish high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that are coming up in the fall. Um, and there's a place on Northwestern's campus, which is probably, I would imagine, if you're familiar with other university campuses, this is on many, pla I mean, on many campuses, there's a place where... Um, like fraternities and sororities and theater groups and other groups hang like painted sheets uh, to announce upcoming events. So you know, Midsummer Night's Dream Thursday, or you know, big party at Sigma Chi Friday. And so we figured we would put up you know Yom Kippur Saturday Repent, um, and uh, and then we realized well you know we could do a little better than that. We could make rather than a painted sheet, we could go to Kinkos, start a long and fruitful relationship with Kinkos. For them, anyway, and uh, <laughs> and we can make a banner, and then we instead of making a statement, we could ask a question. So rather than just announcing that this is coming up, for some, one reason or another, and somebody asked me today during the workshop, why did it occur to you? And I can't honestly say why, but it occurred to me that if we asked a question, you can't. It's really hard to walk by um, when someone's asking a question and not at least think about it. So it was extending the educational work out into the public space. So we asked the question, what will you do better this year? Um, which is sort of the theme of the Jewish High Holidays and, and had little ideas of things that people could do better. Um, vote, you know, drink fair trade coffee, call your parents, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and I, we got a great response to it. People came up to us and it came up to me and said, um, you know, you should, really, you should make more of these. My friend and I, we were walking along, we had a great conversation. Um, so we started making more of these banners, and you know, it, it generally tied to the calendar. So you know, at uh, Thanksgiving, what are you thankful for during fraternity and sorority rush? Who do you belong to? Those are those kinds of questions. One thing led to another. Uh, students starting started getting involved. 
um, faculty started getting involved. We did salons in the campus Starbucks. We were making posters and stuff, and uh, we were in the right place at the right time and um, uh, got a generous grant from uh, the Einhorn Family Charitable Trust um, about four years ago to launch this as a national project. And so now um, we do training and create resources for people to be able to um, not only ask these kinds of questions, but to really design um, uh, or convene and convene designed experiences um, that enable communities of diverse participants to come together for meaningful, intentional, reflective um, group group conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so we do that both on the training side um, of doing uh, workshops um, and and uh, and other kinds of training, and on the resources side. Um, so on our website, um, which you know you probably hopefully you, you've taken a look at, um, you know, about once every month or six weeks or so, we um, develop a new, um, what we call a conversation guide. Uh, and those are really designed to be, um, we're trying to lower the barrier to entry of not only, you know, finding um, uh, text resources that can be used, but also really they're designed to be self-facilitating in a lot of ways. When I run a workshop, when I run one of these conversations, I really, I ask participants to just, you know, to take turns reading um, paragraphs of this, and uh, almost like the, the, the Passover Haggadah, that's really a, an, an inspiration for us from the Jewish tradition of, you know, you can just take turns reading and it's designed to really in a lot of ways, facilitate itself. It doesn't mean that it eliminates the role for facilitator by any means. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there is no replacement for a gifted um, discussion facilitator, but um, but it allows at least people to uh, get folks together for a meaningful, you know, a much more meaningful conversation than we'd have otherwise. Um, could we? Could we? Um, or could you address the question right away? Of um, obvious, I, I think it's obvious from from what you've said, and if you look at the site. Um, based on Jewish traditions is absolutely tr there, but it's not necessary, right? Correct, exactly. So this is not this is not a Jewish initiative at all. It's um, it, it really is. This is for anybody, and it addresses human questions, um, and it uses Jew and it uses human resources to do that. We also have a subset of stuff. Um, for the Jewish community, for using Jewish education in particular, but there's nothing particularly um, Jewish about any of this. Um, I, yeah, I wear two hats. Like I have a rabbi hat and I have a PhD hat, and this is whatever. It's putting both of them together, but I don't feel a need to check either of them at the door. Um, but it's really, um, uh, you know, colleges and universities. Over 75 of them now, you know, are involved in this, and um, it's really designed for you know, uh, people of all backgrounds um, and is, is not geared towards any one particular uh, tradition or, or, yeah. So, and, and, then, and, and, and that's linked to then the methodology behind it, which, you know, I can, I can sort of talk yeah, about. Let's, you know, let's, and, see, and, let's see if Chris or Karen or, or Dan have any questions. At this point, Go we're going to keep interrupting you if that's okay. That, that's great. It yeah. should be... It should be a conversation. Chris, do you have any kickoff question here? Or yeah, I was just looking at the kind of the, the resources page and um, yeah. all the different um, questions. And so I, um, just because I guess I circle around this topic a lot in my own English classes, because we do argumentative writing and it just seems like politics are just, you know, one of the things that gets a lot of my students kind of going. And I noticed the and it's not like voting is not a big deal at the moment, but uh, it soon will be. Uh, right. I, I was just checking out the conversation guide for how do you decide who to vote for. Right. So um, it looks like there's these are meant to be um, face to face discussions, right? For me, I mean, yes. I mean, in the, in their design right now, these are definitely intended to be face to face, and we haven't we've had some limited trials of, of trying stuff virtually um, really with, with sort of with our staff with, with, who are located around the country um, and uh, it, 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 I wouldn't say it can't work it, and I would not say that I would say but, but certainly clearly it would need some development um, well, but our, our focus has really been on, on in-person encounters. Mm -hmm. uh, I say that because it seems like there's a real emphasis on um, like the people facilitating the conversation, right? Like, there's a lot of training that they do. Um, there, th they certainly need exposure to it, and the more you know, the more training, the more practice they have, the better. But at the same time, you know, um, 
I would say it's it's a lot of it comes down to willingness. I mean, we're really trying to, as it sort of like lower the barrier to entry where people can feel, um, you know, like if there's a willing group of folks who want to get together and you know print these out, and everybody has it in their hand, the the, the idea is that you know this could generate um, a, a productive conversation that's also characterized less by argument and more, you know, less by less by debate and argument and more by trust narrative. Um, story, which is not meant to, it's not meant to replace, um, you know, when you're saying, you know, in terms of argumentation, it's not meant to replace um, uh, ultimately having, you know, you got to make a decision. Um, you're, you, you, we, sh we should be trying to make decisions as communities, as individuals and communities, but, um, you know, the way that we talk about it, these kinds of conversations, big questions, and I'll talk, I, I can tell you more about in terms of theoretically where we're coming from, but um, that these are the conversations that build the trust that then you need to, in some sense, spend um, when you're going to ultimately have, uh, you know, a political conversation or something that requires, um, you know, re re requires making a decision. Yeah, my cool. last point there is I was just thinking as a teacher of teenagers that, like, they're, they're all capable of these kinds of conversations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and we've done and we've done some limited work with teens, and 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 successfully for sure. Karen Fassenpower, welcome. By the way, you have a different background tonight. Just want to say hello. Yeah, I'm in a different room today because then I finally got this computer to work. Okay. So it's interesting to think about the sort of different ways we have conversations, and I think um, I'm interested in. Josh, when you say virtually, like what you've thought about for that, and obviously, you know, this group. We have this conversation in this way um, every week. And then I also just, I think as I was looking at some of the things on the site and thinking about this, my mind just always immediately goes to writing. So I'm uh -huh. interested in your thoughts about different ways you've thought about it or what you think the variables and dynamics are. Hmm. Um, I mean, I think as, as far as the virtual piece goes, um, you know, so much of this is really designed. Our, our, what we're trying to do is we're tr we're trying to build um, communities of trust, and um, and so th there's already, you know, if you have a virtual group that doesn't really know each other, like so tonight, you know, so we don't really know. I don't know. I don't. You know, I, I'm learning about you as we go, but um, uh, but yeah, it requires. Well, just to say, know. communities of trust is something we've been saying recently too. But go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, trust and empathy. I mean, um, and so there's there there is even there's much more of an active imagination that's required in a virtual you know community. One of the things that we do when we're you know physically together is you know emphasize sitting you know in a circle, no tables, you know where you can see everybody, you can see everybody's full body, um, and uh, and and that there's a certain um, egalitarianism or democracy, you know, related um, concepts that that are that, that's emphasized there, um, and also by empowering people that, that if everybody has the same thing in front of them, you know, you know that they have the same thing in front of them, and therefore everybody is present and participating. So, I don't think that any of those things are necessarily those things can be over, I wouldn't say overcome. I think they can be addressed in a virtual, you know, in this kind of space. Um, uh, it, it just requires a, a more of an act of trust and imagination, um, I think. But um, uh, but that's not a reason not to do it. Um, mm -hmm. as, as I think you're, as, you're yeah. honing in on trust is the right issue. Because I would say some of the communities that I participate in virtually, I have a much stronger trust bond with than some right. of the groups I'm in face-to-face. -face. So it's really about that dynamic maybe more than the media. Yeah, and, and you know, my my wife is a, is a writer, and um, I mean, this goes maybe a little bit to your second question. You know, some of her most intense, intensive, and intense relationships are with other writers who she's met like through Twitter. You know, and uh, where they have spent months or years, even you know, involved in very um, intimate relationships as critique partners. Um, you know, and 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 sharing each other's stuff and that obviously spills into other areas of their lives before they've even met in person. Um, so, uh, and, and that can be across far-flung areas. And I think part of that, again, is related to imagination. I mean, these are all 
um, fiction writers, novelists, uh, young adult writers, actually. And, um, you know, clearly they have a well-developed capacity for imagination. Um, and, and so it's, uh, there's something here, you know, on a theoretical level related to the idea of imagined communities and, um, uh, and all of that, I, w I can't put it all together. This is the first this is the first time I'm like putting these thoughts together in this way. So you're asking an interesting question for me. It's fun. Dan, do you want to say a little bit about now common and how it relates to communities of trust, or does it? Um, well, I I think it certainly it certainly can, and I hope I hope there is you know something about it that's organic to building that trust. Um, I, I I may if can, can I get a five or ten minute pass on that question? Sure. Because I was yeah, anything what, else on your mind too? I just wanted no, to get you in. The, in well, the no, I want, I, want, I want I want to go back to that for sure. But um, Josh, he was mentioning he was he was going to talk a little bit about the methodology, and I I had read. He pointed me toward a, a New York Times article that was written mm -hmm. about uh, ask big questions. That talked about some of the techniques that they use. So, for example. Instead of instead of it being more of an argumentative focus where you're marshalling facts and you know doing some you know rhetorical approaches, that his methodology focused more on like I statements and how you know how do I feel about things, and and I think maybe if I, I was going to ask that question about how now comment might tie in or whatever, but I'd be curious to hear him develop some of that methodological stuff first. Sure. Um, so that's, a, that's that's probably a good jumping off point. So actually, let me see if I can share my screen with you. Um, if that'll work. Yeah, that let's try. I'm pressing it, but I'm not getting anything here. Um, hmm. You're All pressing right. the green button in the top right. Share screen. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the top left. Top yeah. left. That's right. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Um, but it's not it's not happening. Oh, oh no, 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 no. All right. Well, I'll just I'll 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 walk you through it. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> uh, That's fine. Yeah, so, so so we we really we. So one of the things was that when we were when we were creating all those banners, um, as I was working with our student our students and, and there were some questions that I thought sort of landed and and some didn't, and we weren't exactly sure you know why. You know why certain questions seem to work, but I knew that I internally had a resistance to questions like, "Are people naturally good or evil?" You know, um, or you know, do I don't even remember what, what it was. It was some question about inequality, but it was for, you know, d does does uh, does inequality breed segregation? Which, in retrospect, I don't even know what that question really. I'm not sure what that's doing, but anyway. Um, but but those questions, for whatever reason, they didn't land nearly as well for me as questions like, um, where do you feel at home? For whom are we responsible? Those kinds of questions. And it was only when we started as this national program, we had to then you know to really develop a methodology and teach it, that it occurred to us that um, the kinds of questions that we seem to be really that seem to work best satisfied two criteria. They were um, they matter to everyone. They're questions that matter to everybody. And they are questions that everyone can answer. So, um, and when you like then map a typology, and right, you mean you start everybody to sort of, can answer right away, kind of thing. Well, right, or they can, and they lead to a story, right, or they have a okay. story to share mm -hmm. about. That leads to the second piece, which is, is focusing on narrative. But if you just think for a second about those questions, um, you know, so you have questions, for instance, that everyone can answer but don't matter. Right, so those are like classic icebreaker sorts of questions. What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? You know that sort of question, um, which we've all been in those kinds of meetings, and um, we ask those questions precisely because everyone can answer them, and yet you go around the table, you hear that, and um, you don't really necessarily. I don't leave with a larger sense of community, a larger sense of having discovered something about someone or myself. And Josh, um, could I just throw in there that um, when we get students together in hangouts like this, mm -hmm. um, often there are, I think there's too much time on those kinds of questions. Like, what's your mm -hmm. favorite song? You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. There's a connection that happens, but 
what you just said is that the questions don't seem. Well, there's to be... no there's no stakes to that question, right? I mean, there's no vulnerability. There's no you know, so it's it's very low stakes. It feels very accessible, but it's also meaningless. So, um, and then on the other side, you have like you know questions that are that that matter to everybody, but that you know nobody can answer. So you know, I would say like, does God exist? <laughs> I would say it probably matters to everybody, but at the end of the day, you know, you're not going to answer that um, in that form in any definitive way. Um, people can talk about their personal experience, but in objective terms, you're not going to. Where it gets really interesting is when um, what we talk about the difference between big questions and hard questions. Hard questions are questions that matter to everybody, but they require some ex expertise um, to answer. Only some people can answer them. So, uh, and I should say that it's really people who think they know something about those questions can answer them. So it's a lot of, those can be policy questions like what should we do about climate change, right? Um, or uh, who should you vote for in the next election? Um, when you frame a question that way, A, it almost, it generally leads to debate. B, um, it also disenfranchises anybody who doesn't feel like they know enough to participate in that conversation. So. Um, and so, uh, so if you take that voting example, for instance, who should you vote for? Um, we probably, you know, if you've been at a dinner party where uh, where that question has come up, and there's ten people at dinner, um, my guess is that when a f within a few minutes, you know, two or three people will peel off and go to the living room, you know, on the couch. A couple more will go out to the backyard or you know the porch or something. Um, a few will make themselves scarce in the, you know, in, in the kitchen helping get dessert ready. And what you'll have left is a couple of people who really feel like they know what they're talking about or feel strongly, and they'll be discussing or arguing or debating. Um, you know, and so I think those are sort of, the, the, those kinds of questions, they're also, they also really dominate our, um, a lot of our academic discourse and our political discourse. They're designed to prop up experts and make them look smart. And probably um, our social media discourse too. Uh, yeah, probably, probably. Mm -hmm. So if you flip that, then though, so so, the, and this is this is our you know a key piece of our technique. If you turn that hard question into one that everyone can answer, so I would take that question, who should you vote for, and I might turn that into, um, how do you decide who to vote for? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and now, well. I you know I like this person's pol you know I, I like I follow policy positions I'm interested in policy positions or what they would do well I'm actually interested in you know I think divided government is important so I might you know or I don't want divided government or um, I'm tired of the corruption of this political party even though they reflect my beliefs more you know that's more important I like the way this guy looks I like the fact that you know he's a war veteran I want to see the first woman president there's a lot of different rationales and those things th that then becomes much more open. Um, and you're actually learning something about someone, and you're not asking them necessarily to take a political position. Um, uh, so it's a it's a way of opening up that question. Um, you know, some other like some sort of classic examples for us are the difference between the question, um, what is responsibility, or versus right, who are you responsible for, or for whom are we responsible? Um, so typically. What big questions do then is, um, as opposed to hard questions, big questions lead to stories rather than debates. Um, they uh, they invite participation um, by everyone. They are generally they're always um, directed at a subject, at a you or a we, um, rather than just an object about you know about the information itself. Um, and so when you when when we when we sort of when you think about when you when you craft the question that way, it really has um, an enlarging effect. Um, and most often, these questions really stand outside of time. They're really philosophical questions, but they're posed in such a way that um, they speak to us. They're often too big to actually answer, and you need to then have smaller questions that allow people that are experiential. So, you know, when you have voted, you know, why have you voted for the person you voted for, or um, where do you feel at home? Well, you know, when's the time you felt really like at home? When's the time you felt a stranger? Um, you know, uh, is there a place you particularly associate with home? Are there people you associate with home? You can unpack those with some of those smaller questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, but 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 they but but when you've set it up this way, it really follows that trajectory. So that's that's like the, you know one of the big pieces that we do, and then I can talk more about how we sort of yeah, use let's... object and interpretive discussion. But we can save that for down the road.
No, yeah, let, let's hear what people are thinking about the questions. Uh, one, one, and I'll start by saying, are you familiar with Grant Wiggins' stuff around and um, his central questions? You know, so I'm just getting familiar with that um, and, mm -hmm. and, and like learning by design. Um, yeah. uh, something here. I'm, screen, by the way. Now I've got it. Now, now I can put it up here. But um, he, even, here, he even uses the word hard questions. It's interesting, but uh -huh. sure. Um. So this, this, if you can see it, is sort of this um, typology. You can see it, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh wait. So how does that stay on? Oh, it stays Sorry. on. If I no, it stays on. I think it's me. Okay. <laughs> People have to click on it for it to stay on. Okay. All right. If you want to so look that's, at it, that's click what it, you click just it. explained, right? Yeah. Okay. This is this is this, yeah. This this is more or less what I just explained here. Um, right, big questions versus hard questions, mm -hmm. um, and it's a little small, so maybe I can make it bigger here. Yeah, it's uh, we can see it a little bit, but there, I, that's fine. Uh, you need to click on it, Paul, for it to sound. Yeah, I got it, Karen. It's on. Yeah, thanks <laughs> on the video. So, um, so and, and worth saying also, like we essential to. Youth voices, I think, and the work we do around inquiry um, and research and so forth. Um, a lot of us do our questions. Um, you know, we we have kids pose questions and think about questions that they want to explore. So I'm, I'm kind of you know, just to say that in the background as well. Anybody mm -hmm. else have Chris? You have any thoughts about what you've heard here or how this relates wow. later? I mean, I see that happen in the classroom a lot, what Josh was saying, like, to go back to my uh, political example, mm -hmm. you know, it does, it can be dominated by, uh, you know, the experts in the classroom, or the mm -hmm. perceived experts, and, uh, you know, I do like the idea of switching it to the big question instead of always the hard question. I mean, sometimes you, you need to ask both, I suppose, sure. but um, right. it's it's an easy entry point, I think, for everybody, and that's probably, you know, just as important right there. Mm -hmm. Would Would this be a good time for me to come Go back? Ahead. That? Whenever. Yeah. Okay. I'm going well, well, to take this off so I can see you guys. So. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I was I was thinking it was interesting it, it, w having Josh's methodology did make it easier to you know, to, to kind of work in sort of a now, pers a now comment perspective on conversation and discussion. Um, I, think, I think now comment works pretty well, actually, for accommodating both kinds of discussions we were talking about, the, the rhetorical and the um, sort of the narrative and the personal, because what, one of the key things about a sort of an asynchronous text conversation in, in now comment I mean the other tools as well is that y you you know everyone gets to react to what they want to react to so in Josh's example of the you know at the dinner where you you know <laughs> it, it was actually perfect the way he described it because if I want to talk about who I voted for but the other people in the room want to talk about you know what they cared about, like you have to go in a separate room because when you're having a live conversation, one person talks at a time, and and you know that you know they have the floor. Everyone else is supposed to listen, and and sometimes whoever starts the conversation kind of sets the tone, and you kind of ramble on in, on that track for a while. Hmm. Whereas with an, a, an asynchronous tool like now comment. You know, it, again, with a little bit of facilitation from a teacher or from a group leader or whatever. Um, but when you tell the students, you know, I want you to, you know, here's this document that you've read, this text, whatever. You know, what do you think of it? Very open ended. And you know, some of the students will have, and this is from using it at a high school level, at a college level. But we're we're seeing the same things now at a, you know second and fourth grade levels, not so much at the um, rhetorical argumentative level, but but the students, people, people do I think naturally, you know, kind of jump in and, and react to the document with with what they want to say when they have the freedom to and you know when they have the floor to do that. 
Mm -hmm. So I think it, it avoids some of those problems where, you know, if you have those two experts that really want to go at it with each other, they can, but because everyone can react to whatever parts of the document they want to, everyone gets to have those personal um, a work in their narratives, tell their stories. You know, everyone can work with it at slightly right. different levels if they want to. Right. So that, that, that's all I was going to say. Cool. It's interesting. I mean, the, the asynchronous piece is really interesting to me because, as you said, you know, we work, our method is very much working in time. And it's interesting, like, you know, when people go through our training, when we, you know, students, what, what they tell us about what they learn most, one of the things that they learn most is listening skills, you know, and being able to sit there and listen, and also learning how to sort of modulating themselves and, you know, um, present and listen and, 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 and discuss. Um, and when you translate it to writing, it's, re anyway, it's a really interesting question that Karen was posing, like, how does this then transpose into writing, which by nature is more, you know, tends to be more asynchronous. So that's, that's a really interesting question that, you know, you're, you're, you're making me think. It's really good. Well, it, it, it's also, it's interesting with, from, like, at the university level, um, different teachers use, you know, all these tools in different ways. So, for example, a teacher, a professor might assign a reading to the students and then have them comment on now comment before right. the lecture so right. that they kind of do some pre-processing and pre-digesting amongst right. themselves and then the teacher can the instructor professor can look at what they're saying and then when they're together in the same room then they can you know there's a facilitator able to to handle things you know to lead the discussion where he or she wants to lead the discussion but other times they'll lecture first to kind of help the students with the hard stuff and and then have them comment and now comment you know, once they have some more background and some some constructs with which to look at it. So anyway, it's in from my my way of looking at it is it's not like these aren't uh, competing modes. I mean, they're different modes, but they're very mm -hmm. complex. They can be very very complementary, and there'd be mm -hmm. a lot of situations where you might want to you know sequence one and then the other, and then for other projects reverse it and start with the other one and. You know, now comment, then live, or live, then now comment, or, mm -hmm. you know, however. Mm -hmm. And and the very, very last thing I'll say on that is that, that that initial idea of trust is, is definitely huge. And, you know, we see it in, in university classes where, you know, everyone's pretty willing to jump right in and say something, but it's often only when the class has been going for a few weeks or a few months that the students, you know, know each other well enough that they'll go into more personal, more, well, more personal, more charged kinds of topics. Mm -hmm. So what one of the teachers that's been using now comment for for years uh, in middle school, she's an uh, it's Mary Moore that was on your show a while back, Paul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, she she's tended she used to use now comment at the very beginning of the year. For, for certain topics, and she's now he um, held off on, on some topics for a month or two until the kids get to know each other better, and then she'll introduce that topic a little bit later in the right. sequence of the year, right. just for exactly those trust reasons to give them time to organically develop. Yep. Right. So uh, do you assume on um, Ask the Questions that the groups will be meeting how often? Um, you know, it, re it can really vary. I think, I, I think um, most often we found where it's successful is in, um, first of all, working within groups that are already meeting for a different purpose. Um, on mm -hmm. college campuses, getting groups to form in order to have these conversations is really hard. Um, I think we're leaning towards newer, some new models where you know, we could imagine, for instance, if a university decided that they wanted to have a First year, um, a first year experience program, right? That would start at orientation and go throughout the year. We could see, you know, building um, a curriculum of recurring conversations, right, yeah. over time with the same with, with a group 
um, that you continue to meet with. Um, so I could see something like that. But it, what's interesting, what, but, but I, what, what, I, what I'm also really hearing and what Dan's saying is what, one of the things that makes it, I think, probably successful in now comment is I was thinking, like, how are people behaving differently on this than they would on Facebook? And I imagine that one of the things is there's more of an intentionality and you, you know, presumably if you don't know the people in the class, let's say, you know, you got a large lecture course, nevertheless, you're within some confines of a community. It's not just the public that's out there. Um, and you're, there's an expectation that you are going to be thoughtful in your comments. Um, whereas <laughs> on Facebook, there's yeah. not sort of necessarily that expectation. So my guess is, as a self-governing sort of behavior, right, you're going to get more quality conversation there than you might. You know, there, I, I have some good Facebook threads that res, you know that happen because I got some good friends, and they you know and they're interesting and they 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 know how to place themselves. But there's plenty that also degenerate into you know bad right. well, All these, I mean, I think all these tools and all these techniques are always kind of set in some kind of a larger social context. Right. So, you know, now comment is normally in a classroom where, you know, there's a teacher who can still send you out of class or, you know, if you're inappropriate or whatever. Um, or, you know, these are people, these are private documents usually where it's just shared with a certain group of people so they know each other and all the stuff that Josh was talking about where you're leveraging the existing relationship some. So, Josh, I think, sorry, I just want to, make sure that I yeah. think there are at least three other areas that I when I look at your materials um, we want you to get to talk about you've mentioned narrative quite a bit but there's also an interpretive object which can yeah. be a photograph a video music or text right yeah um, and then there's doing something about yep. your experience so you can you break some of that? Is that a, a, a rough outline? And yeah, well, you you are, you 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 nailed it. I mean, uh, <laughs> well, fact, I, you know what? It's easy to nail because it's so familiar. I gotta tell you. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. Well, right. That, that's the other thing. I I, I, I want to be very clear. We um we take no pride of authorship. We uh we have. Um, yeah. Well, well, except except that you know we're just doing the stuff that good teachers, the, the good educators. You know, mm -hmm. already know how to do. I mean, we're just putting a name on it. But yeah, we talk about exactly those four stages. So ask, share, learn, and do. Um, the ask part, I talk about. I talked about earlier in terms of big questions, um, what those are. The share um, piece is that you know, starting with personal narrative. And so, like in, in introductions, you know, the way that we would, you know, the way you, we can use this in introductions often is um, uh, when we have a group of people come together. Um, like I did this morning, um, we'll we'll go over a set of ground rules, commitments, you know, that are familiar probably from safe space or people are starting to say brave space, but you know, um, safe space sort of uh, you know r guidelines about confidentiality and step up, step back, that sort of thing, um, and then uh, and then immediately moving into asking people to think for a moment of. Um, the, the title of the conversation this morning was "For Whom Are We Responsible?" So, uh, you know, so the, the the prompt at the beginning was, um, "Think of a person um, in your life. When you hear the word responsible, is there a person in your life who comes to mind, right? And it, and you have sort of a story to tell about them. And we give and we have space on. You know, we actually direct people on the page. Just a box, blank space, and you know." write a few words about that or draw a picture or use that just as sort of thinking space but you know who's that person that comes to mind and and it's a question everybody can answer right if you if, if you have made it to the point that you can be in this conversation right and you're talking then you you, you have you you have um, something to say about that um, one of my litmus tests for this by the way is also are these questions that my nine-year-old son and my 78 year old father could you know both um, have, uh, something productive to say about, right? That, that that they could both have a conversation about. Because when we say that everyone can answer them and that they matter to everyone, you know, I'm really serious about that. So that becomes a a good sort of litmus test. And and you know, I think they could both have something good to say about that. So um, so that's this narrative piece. In a lot of ways, that that's really about creating an atmosphere, an environment where people, where everyone is able to speak into a circle. Everyone is able to speak into the community. Um, People are getting, they're practicing listening, they're practicing, um, you know, reflecting and thinking. 
But then, and we could leave it at that, and, you know, I think that plenty of informal environments, educational environments do that, you know, just asking a good question and sharing personal stories. That's kind of, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a well-honed thing. However, oh, I, yeah. yeah. go ahead. Maybe you're going to say it yourself. Well, I was, I was going to then, and then bringing, I was going to bring in the interpretive discussion piece. Well, um, before you do, let me just say that I think, I think there are a lot of pressures to skip over that step, too. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think we would minimize certainly in the formal environment. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, go ahead. But okay. You know, I mean, many of us are involved in writing projects, and I think that personal story stuff is important. And I wrote down the phrase you just said, speaking into the community. Yeah. Um, I the um, and I can see that in a circle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that you're talking about. But I think that's a goal of Youth Voices, too, that when a student posts, they're not just finishing an assignment. Um, and too often that is what happens, I think. But they are speaking to the community in some mm -hmm. way. And so mm -hmm. I wonder how we can get them to be, you know, make that more of a conscious thing that they're doing. But, right. That's interesting. And, yeah, um, and, and we, we do that by emphasizing the responses they get. But just worth saying. Mm -hmm. that, Go ahead. Interpret. So, so, so let, yeah. So, 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 so then, um, and in, in a lot of ways, I think this is one of the most interesting pieces. Is both, I would say, both interpretive and reflective, um, and and in a and, and in a sequence. So, um, uh, interpretive discussion is something I had studied um, during my my doctoral work at Northwestern. I took a course with um, Sophie Heratuni and Gordon. Um, you know, who, if, you, if you're not familiar with her books on, on teaching through interpretive discussion, definitely recommend them. Say the um, name again. I don't recommend Sophie uh, Heratunian, uh, mm -hmm. and now you're going to ask me to spell it. <laughs> H-A-R-O-U-T-U-N-I-A-N, uh, I think. Okay. Um, if you look up Sophie, if you look on Amazon at Sophie and interpretive discussion, you'll probably find it. That's good. Um, That's I, think they were, I think they were published by Yale Press. Okay. Um, so... Uh, in any case, um, so so once we've done that sort of that sharing piece and getting people warmed up, then bringing an interpretive object. And so you know, obviously, I'm I'm quite familiar with using text, and I imagine all of us are. And so that could be you know poetry. It could be an essay, a short essay. It could be, um, but it could also be you know images, photographs, artwork, video, anything that you know is open to interpretation. Um, and uh, and I'll also say like we, we developed this part of it. We, we really um, worked with uh, some some of our friends at um, Center for Civic Reflection um, on as well. And their their website civicreflection.org is is a wonderful resource um, because they've curated a lot of really good um, sort of good reflective interpretive texts. Can you define civic reflection? Quickly for us, though, or what they? they I mean, well, they, they, they basically uh, their method is quite similar to ours, but is a little less. They don't do they don't do the um, the ask and share pieces quite as much as we do. I think mm -hmm. um, they're they're really focused on um, convening uh, community dialogues using interpretive discussion. I would say. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so. Um, or at least they have been. They've gone through some also some transition, and I'm, you know, I'm not entirely sure where they're at right now. But their website is still great. So, um, uh, in any case, taking a text um, or or an interpretive object, and then as a community reading that together, and 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 here I'm talking about something that's short enough that we actually can you know do some work on it. So you know, it's, this is not an entire novel. Um, it's not an entire essay. It might be, you know, at least in the ways that we've done it thus far, it's something that we can actually read in a group together out loud. Um, and, uh, and then focusing on interpretive questions about that object. So, and, and in essence, really, what, what I mean by that is, what does the text mean when it says X? Um, and, uh, and so we... we, we we really try to stay very we 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 try to stay very close to the text, stay close to the object, and in in our in our interpretive work. Um, and once we've done that, as people are doing that, of course, right? They are um, we're trying to get them to you know highlight areas where they might agree or disagree. We're trying to you know um, open things up, but we're also all of that is them doing their work about defining, let's say, responsibility. But they're defining it 
through the work of the interpretive text, which is also lending some depth, depth and breadth to the conversation, linking it to um, not just the people who are in the room, but to human beings who um, are outside the room and outside of, you know, and in the past potentially as well. So, and once we've I done that... Okay, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. And once we've done that, then the other piece that we do, and this is what distinguishes us, I think, from um, sort of like University of Chicago Great Books, which is also interpretive discussion, we then make a pivot to what we call reflective questions, um, which are not even evaluative questions. I mean, evaluative questions, you know, we would know as like, if, if, if interpretive questions are, um, what does the text mean when it says X, then evaluative question would be, what do you think about um, the text, right? A lot of us, I think a lot of teachers, um, a lot of educators, you know, uh, have a habit of sort of skipping immediately to like what do you think about it without doing the interpretive work, and that's a that, that that's something to work on. But but more than that, what does this bring up for you? Um, what does it bring up? What does it evoke in your own life, right? And really bring it to that level, not just what do you think about it, because that can allow you to sort of intellectualize it. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what, how do you feel about it? What do you what is it what does it evoke in your own experience? To link it then back to the stories that we started with. So. This that that's really where I think that in 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 our format, um, the most powerful moment happens when we make that switch from the interpretive questions to the reflective questions. It's also where you can, as as an educator, um, direct the conversation by choosing certain reflective questions. Let's say you wanted to work specifically on um, questions about race and privilege, so you know you could direct it there. You know, at that at that reflective point. But what you've done now is you've had 30 or 45 minutes that has allowed the group to build up trust and allowed people to sort of wade into this and be prepared for um, a much more productive conversation at that point. So but, let me stop there. That, you know, that, that, that's a lot, I know. You mentioned a couple of resources there, which I will follow up on. Um, but when I saw this work, I, was, I, I immediately thought, wow, they're doing Palo Freire, right? I mean, this is, <laughs> this is a Freirean work as well. Um, are you it's, familiar with? It? Yeah, go ahead. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not deeply familiar. I, mean, I know I know his name mm -hmm. in, in passing. I've, I've seen, but um, but no, this is really uh, yeah. Um, but you can no, go just, ahead. Just to say that um, <laughs> he, they use interpretive objects in very much the same way, and especially uh -huh. photographs, um, to say, okay, what's there, but then what's it mean in your life, and, and so forth. I think those that's a great pivot that you suggest. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of success with that. Yeah, and and it seems to me, uh, Dan, uh, going back to the now comment for a minute, um, that this, that's a place for. I mean, if we're doing this in a bigger kind of asynchronous way, in some way, those those steps, that's a place for now comment to jump in, right? Um, um it, well, when you say a place to jump in, what do you mean? I, well, it's a place for. I mean, if we can't have people in a circle together, and certainly we can at times. Um, we can then say, okay, you know what you did in the circle there? Now let's go to the computers sometimes and, and have the kind, same kinds of conversations we're having about this text um, in Now Comment, right? Right, absolutely. And, and you could also, even within Now Comment, if, if you wanted to be a little bit artificial about it or, or structured, depending how you want to look at it, you, you, with Now Comment, you can have the document sort of open and closed and kind of have time controls. So you could say have a, say with a high school class, you could say, okay, I, I want you guys to think, you know, we've, you know, we've read this now. Now for the next day or two. Interpretive just, stuff, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, you could have an interpretive couple days, and then you close, kind of, and people make their interpretive comments, and then you can close the document. The teacher That's might want to either have the students reflect on it, the teacher might want to make a few comments, then the teacher can open it back up, to then have a reflective pass, and mm -hmm. and you you know and you can do multi again time is always the constraint and the challenge, but right. you know you you can structure it to to kind of build in, in a very organized kind of way if if you want to. Well, that's what, I got to say that's helpful for me because one of the things that, um, on in using now comment it's been hard to get kids to go back and into the discussion like they'll post their first thought about it, but. You know, it's hard for them to go back and see it as a discussion that's going on. And so, right. well, you can, and again, it's got some tools. You can 
you can make an assignment. You know, everyone does that. Hey, I want everyone to make three comments. Mm -hmm. And the kids knock off their comments and, you know, they're done with the assignment sometimes, often. But then after people have done that, you can then open it back up and say, you know what, now I want you to make three more comments, mm -hmm. but now respond to what other people have said or right. make just one comment but draw on something that two people have said. Or, you know, you can get very creative with your assignments and have them I, kind of multiple mm -hmm. passes of processing. Go ahead, Josh. For you. I, I was also going to say, I just wonder if there's also ways to link you know, the, the 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 real and the virtual ex or the, the writing activity and the um, and the relationship you know the, the the live relationship which could also also be conducted virtually but but you know for instance one of the one of the things that we've started to do more is in the in our last section this do section which is really just at the end of the conversation then asking mm -hmm. people um, so what do we want to do on the basis of this is there a change is there something you want to do in your own life that you'll commit to doing and um, or that we could do as a community. There's a lot we could do with that. It's very flexible. But, but a very simple thing is we started saying, all right, is there, is there, think of one thing that you want to do in the next, you know, 48 hours that you'll commit to doing. And then with your partner who's sitting next to you, trade phone numbers and put a, um, and, and put a, uh, a, a reminder for yourself 48 hours from now that I'm going to call so-and-so, right, or I'm going to text them and say, hey, did you do the thing how to go? Did you do the thing that you said you were going to do? Um, as a way of building, you know, uh, accountability um, into the into the encounter. Um, and I wonder if something similar could happen here, where people could be journaling, they could be writing their own responses, right? Um, and then you could then have them turning to a neighbor, as it were, or having a having a Skype conversation or whatever um, about, well, what did you write about? Right, and sharing that and talking it through, um, which could then, you know, combining the modalities, right, then you could then go back and do, you know, a, a next round of writing potentially. But I just wonder if that's, that, that could be another way to play with it as well. It, all these things, it, it's, it, it's all, it, it is endless in how you, you know, yeah. what that leads sounds, to the next thing to the next thing. Um, those are like good suggestions, though. Um, I, I want to get Chris and Karen back in if they wanted to. Sorry, Dan. No, no, no. I was not. Yeah. Uh, Karen, did you want to go ahead? Well, she had a so question really, right here in the chat. Yeah. yeah, I'm very interested in the the doing part of it and what's the follow up. And I I like you know I like the the accountability piece, and I think that's something that's great with technology. I'm thinking about some face to face events we we've done where we had people fill out a postcard. And we just mailed them the postcard in two months that said, you know, it's the same. What are you gonna? What can you commit to do in three months? Because I think people get very sort of passionate and committed in these conversations, but I think too often, then we go off to our lives and and nothing happens. And I really like that sort of, what are you going to do? in some kind of automated reminder, whatever that is. <laughs> this kind of goes along with what I was gonna say too, Josh. I bet you you could address them both. And I was going to think, uh, or was wondering about, you know, you've been doing this for a while. When you look back on things, do you do you have some some moments that really stand out with groups you've worked with? Um, so, <laughs> the blessing and the curse of this is that I've done a lot of train the trainer, right? Um, and and we've and we've been, you know, giving this to then people who are implementing it locally, but. Um, uh, you know, but but I know, you know, for instance, like clearly, I mean, all of the, I feel very satisfied with all the conversations that I facilitate. I mean, like what's what's amazing to me is I can use the same. I, I have one text that I really, one conversation guide that I that I use repeatedly just because it's really good, it's really rich, and every every time I do it, um, you know, it's such a good text. It's a poem by a guy named Lowell Yeager called OK, um, and. It's just so rich, and every group is so different. I can even have somebody who participated in you know a previous conversation, and they come back, and it's you know they have the same the same thing where it's it, it's um, you have new perspectives on it, which is great. Um, I will say that you know we've had um, a lot of success working in um, crisis environments after there's been a crisis, mm. some sort of public crisis that happens. And there is a need for people to feel like they're heard um, and be able to have a productive conversation. Uh, 
that has worked. Um, this has worked really well. I was just, I was actually just today talking with somebody at our training today, who uh, works at the University of um, Ohio or at Ohio University rather, not Ohio State, but um, Ohio uh, University, and um, uh, and she was telling me that you know that they had a very highly charged political issue on campus this past fall, um, really raw um, stuff going on, people feeling very angry and, and, and uncomfortable. And she said, you know, we use this, we, we use your material, we use this approach um, to convene folks together and about 60 people who were really, you know, the, the ones who felt they needed it most. Um, and she said that, you know, it was palpable that um, it really helped to Diffuse tension, but also f allow people feel to feel like they were being heard, and being and, and being able to understand other people and where they were coming from. So, um, and we've heard that in other sort of locations as well. Um, when people have had particularly charged environments, I tend to think of what we do um, to this approach as yes, it's effective in crisis times, um, but. You know, after I'm fond of quoting that, that uh, after Hurricane Sandy, I remember reading a um, a piece in the New York Times about oyster beds uh, in New York Harbor, how, how New York Harbor had once been filled with oysters, um, and of course, the, and, and the 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 area surrounding New York is you know mostly wetlands naturally, naturally, and uh, over the course of the 19th and 20th century, of course, all those wetlands got filled in, and the oysters in the bottom of the of the harbor got dredged. And so what happened was then when you have a storm surge, there's nothing to absorb the shock and, you know, lower Manhattan and Coney Island and everything else gets flooded and overwhelmed. Whereas, you know, if you have those natural buffers in place, it's not going to stop the storm from happening, but it will make it less severe when it lands. Um, and I think that there is something about these kinds of questions and this kind of discipline of conversation that... Um, lessens the severity of conflict and, and, and the storms when they come. So, um, so I, I'm not going to necessarily, so, so you know, there's just some examples, but I think it's a general sort of frame of mind of how we're approaching what we do. When, isn't it also like kind of one step back? It's if you have that trust in the community, that, that's really the, like the, the conversational techniques are good because they build the trust, but it's really the trust that it's it's trust and yeah, it's trust, it's trust and 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 and, and empathy, right? Uh, that's that you know that's what it is. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and and I would say that one of the so when you were talking about crisis, I mean, aren't, isn't that where we are right now with Black Lives Matter and with you know the race conversation? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> we've had and, we, and we've had a lot of and we've had a lot of requests from from you know obviously most of our colleagues are on campuses um, for yeah for exactly that um, mm -hmm. we actually have some specific things that we designed in response to Ferguson back in August um, uh, when initially well, broke. even the Bell Hooks piece does um, yeah, yeah right so so there's a lot of ways I mean you know how are we seen what do we choose to ignore um, uh, when do you take a stand I mean there's there's a, there's a lot of Different ones that we have up there, um, and you know, in some way, it, obviously the text matters, um, but also in a lot of ways, it's just it's the process, even more so that's um, you know that's important. And I'm I'm really just I'm delighted with the idea of like you know how we can thinking more deeply about how writing can be part of this. I think is really, you know, the, the, yeah. that, my my gears are turning. <laughs> so so I let me just say the do part. Um, <laughs> For, for me out of this conversation and conversations we've been having recently um, is that we have been talking now for a couple months about getting Youth Voices Live going again, getting kids during the school time. We need to find a time, Chris Sloan. Let me mm -hmm. send you a postcard and say, help me do that. <laughs> when, um, I, because I think some of your kids could be leading some of this, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. So think about that. Yeah. But... Um, it seemed to me that, and you said this earlier, Jess, that we needed, and, and then Dan suggested, um, you know, why don't you guys have a text of the month kind of thing? And then Aspic Comments has sort of a text of the month. And so it seemed, so we, we, I put a new tab on Youth Voices called Questions, but now, you know, there's a, 
there's all your guys, which, uh, all the ask big yeah. questions stuff is there, but then there's the, the text there to play with as well. And what I would love is if there could be a couple of times each month when kids could get together and maybe do the stories one time and then come back together having read the text together and then do the text um, the second time. That's what I imagine. Um, and so we can kind of experiment with how this might work. Hmm. How's that sound, Chris? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, scheduling apart, um, yeah. you know, because we're time zones apart, uh, different schedules. But, um, I mean, I can make that work just physically. Like, uh, I could do a similar kind of project or, you know, similar conversations with face-to-face -face groups because I have a two-room classroom and I could have another room convene, you know, by a computer and um, do that same thing live. Mm -hmm. um, so I can make those things work. I want to try to get it, uh, you know, think about the questions. But what do you mean by that? Like, yeah, I mean, part of part of what I worry about is, that, and we gotta move on here. But so maybe we could talk about this another time. But um, like, I just want. I would love. I I think we need a common text, right, for some of this conversation to happen. Um, and then it can go anywhere, but yeah, you know, I think Youth Voices Live needs a common text and a common question. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we, that's I, it's just it's just some quick thoughts here at the end, um, where we might be thinking about things. Um, and that's and I'm gonna finish with that. But Karen, you have any thoughts you'd like to add? And we'll hear everybody one more time. Yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, and thank you, Josh, for being here. And then just sort of off topic, but I want to give a plug for everybody to vote for the DML competition that Youth Voices is in. Um, it is DL, dmlcompetition.net slash proposals, and it's the Trust and Online Civic Discourse proposal. And if you have not voted, I will put the link Everywhere. And please All the things thank you, everyone. I trust in online. Support. Exactly. It's a good title for tonight. <laughs> well, Paul, Paul shared that link. I have already voted, and okay. I would be happy. I would be happy to have a discussion with Josh about one time in my life when I voted. Why did I vote for that thing? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. I have one other thing that is um, okay. come up twice in the chat room, which is a request for the slides that you showed, Josh. Yeah. If those could be posted somewhere, or if they are posted somewhere, people are interested in them. Um, yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question. Let me let me figure out how we can do that. Um, a lot of that is on the site already too. If you just yeah. move around a bit, but I think so. So I'll so I'll uh, send it to me. I'll uh, put it up with this. Yeah. Okay. We'll we'll take care of that. Okay. Thanks. I I just had, I had a quick final yeah, last thought. Yeah. Short. Yeah. Really short. What you were saying about a, a short text you found was very helpful. You know, not a whole novel. Not what do you guys have some practical experience with? Maybe like how many pages is a good thing because that that might be helpful for. For Paul and Chris, if you so, look at their stuff, I think you're talking paragraphs, not pages. We're, we're, yeah, we, we, I mean, our stuff we tend to limit to like a page, um, okay. typically, or maybe maybe two. Um, Center for Civic Reflection, they their their selections have um, often will run a little longer. Um, they'll, they'll do you know five, six, seven pages. Um, they're they're comfortable with that. Um, and 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 there are certainly ways, you know, there are certainly ways in our format. For, for what we do, it works much better if we if we contain it. Um, and and it, and I will say that like, you know, clearly this is not an approach. If you're looking to get through a lot of material, this is not the way to do it. Um, this is a way to go deep and really, you know, um, yeah. I mean, to, to to mine a text for as much as it as it can yield. So um, uh, yeah. So it's a just important caveat. Sure. Sure. Chris Sloan, you get last thoughts. Wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. Well, um, yeah, I think it's really promising to think about the way we ask questions and to try to get our students to the point where they can be the facilitators that, you know, that ask those those big mm -hmm. questions. 
Mm -hmm. That opens it up for everybody, and that's the problem I have with a lot of my classroom discussion is it's automatically limited to the people who are good discussers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, we're going to keep talking. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Josh, for coming All right. and Dan and Chris and Karen. Um, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Next week, I think we may have um, some young people on next week, if that works out, Karen. We'll see with Kate. Um, and um, so we'll be here again. Um, we're here every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific time. And um, we started... Um, this was uh, founded as a, a show on edtechtalk.com, which is a, a channel of the World Bridges Network that Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier founded. Thank you all. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Again soon. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Good night. night.